Good evening, everybody. I'm going to declare this public hearing open. Um, this public hearing is uh, being convened pursuant to Section 464 of the Local Government Act to consider the Official Committee Plan Amendment by Law Number 3172-2017 and Zoning by Law Number 3166-2017. At this hearing, any person present who believes that his or her interest is affected by the proposed bylaws shall be given the opportunity to be heard on the matters contained in the bylaws. Those of you who wish to speak concerning these proposed bylaws should at the appropriate time commence your address to the council and to the meeting by clearly stating your name and address, uh, although general, not street addresses are appropriate, but you know, just the street, just to protect your privacy. Um, and clearly state whether or not you are in favor or oppose the bylaws, then you may give us the benefit of your views concerning the proposed bylaws. Members of council may, if they so wish, ask questions of you following your presentation. However, the main function of council members this evening is to listen to the views of the public. It is not the function of council at this hearing to debate the merits of the proposed bylaw with individual citizens or with each other. Everyone who deems his or her interest in the property to be affected by this bylaw shall be given the opportunity to be heard at this hearing. No one, uh, no one will be or should feel discouraged or prevented from making any of your views known. Please refrain from applause or any expressions of support or disapproval on the presentations. Not that that happens here. <laughs> People are very respectful. Thank you. Uh, I just thank you for your cooperation in this and we will proceed now with the hearing. So, Ms. McWilliam, if you would like to introduce the bylaw. I'm just going to start quickly giving a summary of the notice that was provided for this public hearing. Thank so, you. it went out in the newspaper, so in the Citizen, on September 6th and September 13th. It was also posted at our public notice posting places and on our website. Okay, thank you. And I believe we're going to move to a presentation from our manager of planning. Ms. Genot, and you're going to give an overview of the changes to the bylaw? <clears throat> yes. Thank you. And this is for the official community plan change first. Well, yeah, we'll discuss this one first. Okay. <clears throat> so there is a proposed bylaw to amend the land use map in the official community plan. This provides the general land use within the city. Um, and so. I'll just, um, so this is the proposed map, and just looking at the old map, we've made a few changes of land use uh, from, from the previous designation um, to fit with the proposed zoning bylaws, so that you may notice that there are some land use designations that aren't, that haven't been changed. Um, that don't correspond with the new zoning bylaw. For instance, um, in the Cairnsmore area, it's designated medium density. In the and the current zoning and proposed zoning are remaining same. So we aren't proposing at this time to change the land use designation. Uh, the areas that we are proposing to change are along the east side of Jubilee Street, changing from commercial to um, to mixed use and or medium or high density residential. And this corresponds with the proposed zoning. The Charles Hoey Park area, uh, currently designated commercial, we've modified that to show uh, parkland and heritage site. Sorry, to show what? Park yeah. and heritage site. <clears throat> And there are a couple properties near the north end of Jubilee Street on the west side that we are proposing to change from low density residential to medium density residential to fit with the proposed zoning. And then on the east side of the highway, some properties that are currently designated high density residential that are medium density residential in the new zoning bylaw. And what area is that? Uh, it's. It's east of the highway, but it's um, on Bundock Avenue, on either side of Bundock Avenue. So um, it actually corresponds, I believe, with the current zoning, which doesn't match the land use map in the OCP. We aren't proposing to change the zoning any further east of that from the current. Yep. OK, 
Okay, thank you. Um, so we will begin, begin the uh, portion of this portion of the public hearing to get public input. So um, anyone who wants to uh, make a presentation to council, this is your opportunity now. Uh, the microphone is at podium, and I'd ask if you, that you would uh, make your presentation from there. Um, uh, recognize that um, that uh, generally five minutes for a presentation on the uh, on the public hearing, and if you have more to add uh, that takes longer than five minutes, uh, after we have heard all other speakers, uh, you can come again additionally to the podium to present uh, further your thoughts. So I would ask for a first time then, if there are any uh, public who would like to present to council in the public hearing. Yes, sir. Okay, this is with the official community plan change part. Okay, I'm going to ask a second time then, are there any public who would like to present to council with respect to the official community plan bylaw amendment? Hearing none, I'll ask for one, the third and final time. Uh, is there anyone who would like to present to council on the official community plan amendment? Sure, yes, please. And just state your name and, and street you live on, and then. Uh, Hi, thank you. I'm Martha Lesher, and I live on Chesterfield Avenue. So, uh, would now be a time that I could comment on th this? Yes. Okay. So, I just wanted to support some of the points that Tom Ireland brought in his. That's the next portion. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Okay, so uh, that was the third and final time. Is there any additional comments on the official community plan portion? Okay, hearing none. Then we'll move on to the zoning bylaw amendments. Uh, Ms. McWilliam, would you like to... If I may, Your Worship, we did receive one piece of correspondence pertaining to both the zoning bylaw and the OCP amendment okay. bylaw. All right. It is attached as part of the agenda package there, but I, I'll just address it now, if I may. Okay. Um, we received an email from Grant Clint stating that they feel the changes will be better serve, the changes to both these bylaws will better serve the needs of our community and environment. They are reasonable and well drafted. Having lived and worked the last several decades in Duncan, we look forward to these amendments being adopted. All the best. And that was from both Grant and Lynn Clement. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so we'll move on to Ms. Cheneau, if you're ready to make a presentation on the zoning bylaw amendment portion of the public hearing. And if it would be easier for you, Ms. Chenoa, you can hold the mic, is that way you can speak directly into it, even sure, if you need to address the uh, PowerPoint? So just to go over um, some of the bylaw, we, our current zoning bylaw was um, adopted in 1988, and uh, we have a number of plans, including our official community plan, that have been developed since that time, and so it was time to update our zoning bylaw. The new layout provides uh, concise content and improves legibility, we believe, of the bylaw. Uh, we've reduced the number of zones uh, for simplicity from 16 to 8. And for the density, we've moved from units per hectare to floor area ratio, which I'll explain later. And we've also included some density bonusing incentives for development. We've also added some clarification on um, the use of accessory buildings for secondary suites. Uh, we've added regulations stating that uh, fabric covered structures may only be used during the winter time for storing of vehicles or recreational vehicles. And we've added regulations for home based businesses within multi unit dwellings and um, included mobile food vending within the bylaw as well in a number of zones. As I mentioned, density bonusing to allow additional 
density for uh, desirable amenities. The public consultation that we undertook, we had a page on PlaySeq, we held a number of open houses and had a table at the farmer's market, and we circulated the bylaw to North Cowichan, CVRD, and also um, Cowichan tribes. So this is the proposed zoning map. It's um, simplified from the, from the current one, as you can see. Uh, also includes some rezoning of properties that I'm going to discuss, uh, show in a bit more detail some of the areas. For instance, uh, just north of here, uh, um, off of Jubilee Street, in this area we currently have a number of zones, RM4, RM3, and RM1. So we're proposing to zone this area high density development, high density residential. It's close to downtown and services and considered appropriate for this type of development. <clears throat> and this shows uh, the downtown and just east of downtown. So currently RM a mix of RM4, uh, C2, C1 zones. So zoning to high density for a portion of this area. And then the new neighborhood commercial zone is the orange color. <clears throat> and then on the highway, changing from the current C3 to a new uh, highway corridor commercial zone. <clears throat> this shows the area that I mentioned um, in the OCP amendment uh, just on the other side of the highway. So. Um, so, in this area, uh, medium density zone, and then um, remaining density uh, just east of there. We also have introduced a map, uh, a low grade parking map, where 50% of the required parking will be required to be underground. These are areas that we have been studying the water level, the groundwater level for a number of years, and is safe to provide underground parking in. There are a number of monitoring wells that have been in place since Peter, about seven years. Um, they're all marked with the blue dots here. So um, in this area, the water is, is suitable for, uh, for below grade parking. Sir, can I just, uh, you, yes, please, yeah. Uh, within the downtown, um, along Evans Street, Jubilee, Kenneth Street, and Boundary Street, where the streets, some of these streets are narrower and have narrow sidewalks, we've added an additional two meter setback to the front and exterior sides of properties. And we've also added a shared access map for the downtown area where uh, new driveway access isn't permitted unless the, the frontage of the property is over 40 meters. So otherwise, a shared access would be required. And this demonstrates uh, the reduction in the zones of the residential zones. So going to low density, medium density, and high density. Within the low density zone, will allow for uh, a duplex or two unit dwelling. <clears throat> and we've also changed um, some of the regulations for secondary suites. So a detached secondary suite under the current bylaw is permitted up to six square meters. It will be permitted to be larger now. Um, for the higher density residential zones, we're moving from units per hectare to floor area ratio. So floor area ratio um, limits the size of a building instead of the number of units. So the size of the permitted building is um, based on the size of the lot and is shown um, as a number we can see here. So 1.2 times the size of the lot is the permitted total gross area for the building. And, <clears throat> and for if amenities such as uh, affordable housing, uh, underground parking or energy efficiency are provided, then a development will be able to achieve a higher level of density. Um, 
going to the commercial zones. We're moving from, uh, from seven zones down to three zones. So downtown comprehensive, neighborhood commercial, and highway corridor commercial. Um, I'm just going to, 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 I have these slides up there in case we need to refer to them, but I'm gonna go through them. Um, some changes, uh, the major changes to the highway corridor commercial zone. Uh, we've added some regulations limiting net caching and pawn shops. Um, we've also removed motor vehicle sales as a permitted future use. The current motor vehicle sales will still, for the, the existing ones, will be permitted, but will become a non-conforming use. Moving to our former institutional zones, going from uh, the name of institutional to community service, and then our park zone will become community park. <clears throat> and so we believe this implements our official community plan and is a more user-friendly and updated bylaw, and I will provide an opportunity now for public. Okay. So, um, as with the uh, Fisher Community Plan uh, Amendment portion, I'm going to call for presentations of the public um, to the uh, um, presentation of this uh, change in the zoning bylaw. Uh, Ms. William, you would like to read in a uh, letter with respect to this, and then I'll ask for the public to come forward on this uh, portion of the bylaw. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, yeah, this is going to be a little bit long-winded, so please bear with me. Uh, we did receive correspondence today uh, regarding the zoning bylaw, and it was received after the agenda was published, so we're following our policy and ensuring that it is read into the public record. Okay. Um, this is from Tom Ireland, who lives at Cedar Place. He has written, Dear Mayor and Council, with this, I'm expressing my views on the proposed new zoning bylaw 3166 2017. I'm unable to attend the public hearing this evening due to a family from out of country visiting. My name is Tom Ireland. I reside at Cedar Place in the city of Duncan. I'm the past CAO for the city of Duncan as well. I have been the past corporate administrator for the city of Prince Rupert in charge of, among other things, bylaws and legal matters. And I was its director of planning for 25 years. I've been a planner for 38 years. During that time, there never been any successful or unsuccessful legal challenges to my planning advice or to the decisions made by council based on my planning advice, unlike some of our neighboring jurisdictions or many others in the province. Overall, I think staff have done a great job of redoing the city's zoning bylaw. I know of at least two persons, myself included, who have provided unsolicited advice and editing privately rather than publicly. We're proud to do this because of our commitment to the community. Many of the matters I've raised have been addressed. Unfortunately, there remain several unresolved issues. Number one, I'm still concerned about the proposed height of accessory buildings with detached secondary suites located in the second story. My concern is that with the permitted height in such close proximity to side and rear property lines and the potential impact on adjacent neighbors, sorry, adjacent people's rear yards and gardens in particular due to shading. The city is encouraging urban gardening, yet at the same time it's taking a situation that currently assures people that no structure more than four meters high can be closer to their rear property line than 7.5 meters, and it is now being proposed that the structures up to 7.5 meters, almost twice as high, can now be within 1.2 meters of people's rear property lines. This is a reduction of a significant portion of a rear yard to 16% of what it currently is. The potential impact on adjacent people's gardens areas will be substantial with that kind of change. I have toured developments in Nanaimo that allow such structures and with such spacing, and you cannot even find a place to grow grass within them as they are so dense. An effort will be made, should be made to calculate the approximate setbacks for accessory buildings relative to proposed height in order to minimize undesirable shading in urban gardening. I am not suggesting accessory buildings that high should not be permitted. Rather, their placement needs to be carefully considered, or needs more careful consideration. The city made the proponent of a proposed development on Bray Road submit sun shading diagrams for his development. Surely, city staff can be directed to calculate a minimum stack for side and rear property lines that would minimize the impact of shading from taller accessory buildings. The detached buildings being proposed are not small by any stretch. 
They could be up to the size of my own existing house. Curiously, as well, such detached dwellings can even be closer to the side properly of the line than the principal building, even though they can be essentially the same height as the principal building. Number two, I am surprised to see the sudden shift in sentiment regarding fabric covered structures. In brackets, he's written tents. It is proposed to allow such structures up to 23 meters square in area, that's 247.6 square feet, or the equivalent of a single car garage for temporary storage purposes. Temporary is not defined. If you happen to be storing motor vehicles or recreational vehicles, you can only have such structures on site for the period of November 1st, March, 5th, March 1st. But there is no set time period for temporary storage of other things. So what is temporary? Further, there is no limit on the number of such structures permitted on any one lot. There is no height restrictions either. The date permitted for storage of motor vehicles or recreational vehicles suggests that if you are only storing other objects, you can have them on site any time of the year as long as it's temporary, whatever that is. Currently, there is a prohibition against storing RVs over a certain size on residential properties. Whereas the proposed zoning bylaw provides no such restrictions, in fact, it enables storage in tents on the property. Number three, I have suggested that the regulations regarding placement of heat bumps also apply to air conditioners and generators. They may make some noises, may, they make the same noise as pumps, or in the case of generators, are even worse. I also think that the proposal that they be allowed in front yards is unnecessary and ill advised. If the front yard is the only potential location available on any particular site, a variance permit could be applied for. Number four, strictly, strictly a technical bylaw drafting matter, but one which could later be problematic is that all zones except the low, medium, and high density residential zones have subdivision regulations incorporated. The three zones mentioned instead, mentioned instead only have conditions of use that include some implied subdivision regulations. Why not make it clear in the section titled that there are conditions of use and subdivision regulations included in those sections? Otherwise, it appears that there are no subdivision regulations for those zones. <laughs> Number five, I'm left with the impression that there are a lot of things that this bylaw will allow a person to place into the required yard areas. This is because of the low density residential zone, the yard setbacks are only for principal buildings and accessory buildings. In some cases, parking and heat pumps have setbacks as well, but there are no setback requirements for any other structure that may be on the property, Impli implying they can be located anywhere, even within the required yard setback areas. The yard setback areas are intended to facilitate passage and access around the buildings for firefighting, maintenance, air, and light. There is no overarching clause in the proposed bylaw that stipulates that the required yard should be kept clear of everything except permitted encumbrances. It is common for zoning bylaws to stipulate something along the lines that no building, structure, or feature, or portion thereof shall be developed, used, occupied, constructed, erected, modified, converted, enlarged, reconstructed, altered, placed, maintained, or added to within any required yard except as follows, provided that they meet the provisions of the building code. Or yard means an open space on a lot, unoccupied and unobstructed by any building or structure except as otherwise provided for in the bylaw. For the purpose of this definition, a fence is not considered a structure. I suggested to staff that they should consider using floor area, sorry, number six. I suggested to staff that they should consider using floor area ratio to regulate the density of the development in low density residential zone for essentially the same reason that they have proposed floor area ratio for use in the medium and high density zone as well as commercial zones. Floor area ratio is more flexible with respect to the size of units based on location and market. Floor area ratio encourages more imaginative housing style and accommodates different needs. Floor area ratio, for example, enables a person who has accessibility issues to build a ranch style home with the same amount of floor area as someone who builds a two-story home. Otherwise, without it, they're limited to half the floor area of everyone else. Without using floor area ratio, someone wishing to maximize the size of a building on their lot is limited to developing a three-story box. Using floor area ratio, they may have a building that is larger on the bottom and smaller on the top because they can build any size they want to provide to, sorry, they can build any shape they want provided to, they do not exceed the maximum coverage permitted by the floor area ratio, FAR. They still have to respect the setbacks as everyone else, but better and more flexible designs are encouraged and permitted. 
The foregoing are my remaining primary concerns from my original submission to staff. I apologize if there are any grammatical or, type or typographical errors in this letter as I have not had long to prepare the information and have other obligations to attend to. Sincerely, Tom Ireland. Thank you. So thank you. Um, so I will ask at this point, is there any uh, persons in the public who would like to make a presentation to council? If you'd like to, please, and give your name and street you live on and, uh, and your thoughts. Um, thank you. Not much of a presentation. I just uh, came across this information uh, this afternoon as it was... Um, uh, what, what is your name, sir? Uh, Kevin Miller, Signet Place. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I just had a, a few questions. I'm not sure if we have privy to go back to any of those slides um, that, were, that were given. Um, the first one that I had uh, um, some query about was the uh, setback to Plovick Roads, um, Kenneth Street, and Evans uh, boundary. Um, in the presentation, it was said that there was a set setback requirements were on the uh, on the frontage uh, and the side, whereas um, I was in the uh, print off here. It says um, setbacks of two meter setback on the on the front or the side. And so it's just during the presentation um, given earlier, it was as an and, so I just wanted to clarify if it's an and or an or, just to understand if, because um, I do own uh, land in that area, um, buildings, uh, to understand what setback requirements would be required when the zoning was changed. When you're dealing with a uh, frontage of only 30 feet by, and then a, a, a lot of, you know, as you know, most downtown lots, 30 by 120 is pretty common. Um, when you're setting back two meters, that's 16.7 percent of the whole lot is set back on the, off versus the front side there. Um, on the side, if a two meters back um, from 30 feet, that's uh, that's even a, a larger amount, obviously, considering there's only be about nine meters, so it would be two ninths. So 22 percent would be required setback. Um, so I just wanted some clarification again, if that was going to be on the front and side or just front or side. So on the, this. So just on the back, this front or exterior side. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that one just said front and. Okay. Perfect. So that's, that helps me out a little bit understanding that. Um, going back to the, um, the 50%, or no, the, yeah, so the 50, the parking, uh, below grade parking. If I could just understand, um, so is that you're just stating that all buildings within that zone are now, any redevelopment of that will, will have to require underground parking? Is that kind of the, the genesis of this idea, Peter? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, unless it can be shown that uh, there are a couple that might be on the cusp, if I may. Sure. Th thank you. Um, just to clarify, the yes, within that zone, it's intended that 50% of the required parking for those sites would be uh, would require underground parking as opposed to surface. Part of the rationale behind that is that currently uh, in the downtown zone in particular, parking is exempt entirely. Uh, we're trying to transition now that we know after seven years of uh, study that underground parking is feasible within that zone, that we want to encourage the highest best use of the, the land in that area uh, and as such uh, require 50%. If a parcel can be shown that the groundwater, uh, perhaps on the periphery of the, that zone, uh, it's not feasible, perhaps it's only a, right on the edge of it might be a, a foot below, then uh, th that might be something uh, council can consider that a later date as to uh, the rationale behind not providing it in certain scenarios. But uh, in the downtown core itself, we know that uh, the groundwater doesn't come uh, anywhere closer than uh, about nine feet below the surface. So. Yeah, I know it seems to be seems to be working well. We've, we've got a couple that have, have been installed now that seem to be working great. Um, can you explain the 40 meter um, rule? purpose for this one is to reduce the number of crossings on the sidewalks um, okay. is one of the main purposes for yeah. pedestrian safety um, in the downtown core because a number uh, and because some of these
properties are quite narrow. So, so if each individual um, property has a, a driveway access, it does uh, create a lot of cars crossing sidewalks. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay, so, so the so the forty meter is it? That's a that's that's more than four standard lots. Is what I'm understanding there, because the standard lot is thirty feet on frontage for a lot of. Okay, so it's so it's, it goes into a third, a third lot. You need a third lot to find a driveway where you have to share. Okay, just had to definitely understand which way we were going with that. Now, um, with the with the fifty percent parking, which I, I totally understand, could we? Ex um, so if you've already got an, an existing um, commercial building um, in the downtown core, and you just um, basically want to refurbish or let's call it um, level and put down a single level commercial building. Is there underground parking required for single level commercial? Or is it just purely residential? Uh, so, so first of all, the in the downtown, the ground floor uh, is still going to be exempt from parking requirements. Um, and anything above the ground floor would re require parking. Uh, there is a new minimum height for buildings in the downtown as well of, of two stories. A new minimum? Yeah. Okay, so, so every building that gets now redeveloped will have to have parking underneath. Underneath or, off, or at the rear, or yeah, may have to have some parking underneath, yeah. But they can't put driveways in. Unless there's shared access or it's um, a lot you can, you can a, a side of a lot. The that's heavy restrictions longer. that are all of a sudden being imposed. Um, and just, just for a bit of record, I, I, I noted at the beginning you guys stated where you guys all put out the information for this. Uh, so unfortunately, I don't uh, attend the market. And um, I didn't go to, um, and I don't read the paper a lot, I do a lot of online reading. Um, and as such, you stated that this was the first major change since, uh, so for the OCP since 1988, um, and this seems to be go hand in hand um, with that, that, um, that there was no um, communication sent out to building owners in the city of Duncan at all that this was take place to ask for input. I just, it was included in the newsletter um, as well as um, we distributed notice of the one of the open houses through the DBA and Chamber of Commerce as well. Does the newsletter get mailed out to all? And what does it go to? Through your worship, the newsletter is distributed to all residents in Duncan and all, all of the downtown area as well. Um, it, the mail distribution routes are not 100% contiguous with our boundaries but it does cover at least 90% of the whole city. And if I had an address, like a business that owns a piece of property downtown, where would that have went? It would have gone to the business, the property itself within the city of Duncan. Okay, that doesn't sound. So I, I own buildings in the city of Duncan. I don't live in the city of Duncan. I receive no correspondence. I just thought that was, um, that was quite tricky, um, considering I own three structures in within the city. And the first I heard of this was um, was a fellow friend that brought it to my attention today at two o'clock that this was so far along already. I just thought it was, um, you would expect to be a, a little little more um, a little more news on something so grandeur as uh, the, the proposed changes that the council is um, is making today, which um, it was asked if I opposed or. Uh, was in favor, and, and I'm totally in favor. The the, the amount of zone rezoning in this, uh, the amount of zones that are already in the, st in the city is 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 for the amount of size of the city is crazy at 16. It was so hard to understand. Um, the work that you guys have done has been fantastic. I have to admit, it's it's awesome to get it restricted right down. I'm a little concerned with the um, the straight forcing of um, if I own a 30 by 120 piece of land in the city. Um, anytime that I want to try to develop that now, 
um, that I'm going to be a forced to immediately go up two stories, and then on top of that go down a third, um, increasing the development cost about 400 percent to be able to have to go underneath the ground, and then all of a sudden add a second floor to um, pieces of land that I've only owned for the last seven or eight years. Um, I'm just a bit astounded at the, the forced effort that the city is going into that. Um, now, there was, I noticed, I, I tried to scan the 60-page document as fast as I could this afternoon. There was some uh, penalties or fees if parking is not required. Could you speak to that? I don't know how to understand that. There's an $8,000 and a $25,000. And how those are um, decided. I'm just going to that section. For a development, um, the owner has the option of providing um, a, a fee in lieu of up to 20% of the required parking, sorry, 25% of the required parking for the development. So, um, for a surf parking space, it would be $8,000 per space, or if it's a required um, underground space, then it would be $25,000 $25, per space. Per space. Okay. Thank you. Um, we have a similar no, policy we have, in we've place We've had that currently. policy in the bylaw for quite some time, actually. Right, yeah. That's I, seated this particular zoning change. Sure, and I think it was made total sense, I think, until... Um, when you own a building downtown and you had no intention of going up, and then all of a sudden you are, have no choice. Uh, I, I think that's um, very limiting and very nearsighted on council's uh, uh, part, in my opinion, on that. Um, it, uh, it all of a sudden heavily restricts the, uh, any, uh, any attempt at resale value or um, further, as a, as a business owner, in town, for me, it now also um, restricts any chance of development uh, going forward. Um, before, you know, being a small business owner in the community, owning a few pieces of uh, commercial property, um, I looked forward to uh, being able to um, develop and get rid of a, a couple of old looking structures in the city core. Um, now, to be told that if this passes as is, um, it'll be my kids' kids that will be able to afford to do. Um, proposals like this, it will not be um, small mom and pop operations, it'll be just us having to sell at a discount to a developer who will then um, only have the ways and means to uh, go ahead and try to expand it, which I guess if that's what the city is trying to do, then congrats, you've done it. Um, you've, you've, you've taken all of the ability for ownership of the city at all to be, be done locally, which is, um, which is a little sad. I noticed that the, the C3 zoning um, comments was primarily around um, the, uh, the, the, the highway corridor. Um, I noticed that on the map was a C3 building on the corner of uh, Duncan and Trunk. Um, authentic pizza, um, raised used goods, uh, Young's auto detailing, all that kind of stuff. I noticed that that's, that it was C3 and now it's going to have further restrictions imposed on it uh, in the new uh, rezoning. So those, so the the one you referred to at the corner of Duncan and Trunk is proposed to be rezoned uh, downtown commercial. That's right. And then there's another. Uh, a lot in the downtown as well. It's currently C3 that's also proposed to be uh, downtown commercial. Yeah, and so those added further restrictions to those. Um, what's the genesis behind that? Um, and, 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 when, and what, what do you say to the, the people that own those lots that to, you know, you've, you've had this, this is what it's zoned, you have the um, flexibility in right to do as you wish, um, plan any further development going forward uh, just to find that the um, rezoning has now just stripped away um, usages. 
without not even a letter? So, uh, I'll, I'll have to clarify the, the mailing uh, uh, circulars as to what we did, but with respect to it being uh, further restricted, it actually has additional uses that don't exist in highway corridor, but th what it does remove is uses that it's felt is no longer appropriate in a, in a downtown core, like uh, car lots as we've removed on the highway as well, in addition to um, gas stations and whatnot, not felt that that's is appropriate. There's also another parcel, uh, the existing boundary lot, for example, that's on the very west side of downtown. It's currently a C3 as well and would, would have, uh, you know, not something you would traditionally see in a downtown corn environment. So that's the, the main uh, rationale behind why those are no longer appropriate to see a C3. Uh, there are a couple of uh, parcels that are in the downtown core that do have gas stations uh, up at the co-op, for example, on Canada Avenue that are uh, specifically uh, designated as um, allowing for the um, a gas station because they're existing as it stands. So it, they are sort of, even though the, the neighborhood commercial or downtown commercial don't allow for those, we allowed for those because they're actually existing uses. So those that are currently uh, functioning uh, will continue to do so. And that's what it makes for the exemption is the, the auto body shop, I guess, on Duncan for down then, is that? Uh, Th that's since closed, but the, not the bo auto body shop doesn't have one. Yeah, oh, that one. Uh, no, not Dunk Street. Um, yeah, uh, and lastly, if I may, just sort of in, in, in sort of overarching comment regarding uh, restrictions and whatnot in the downtown, the, the overarching intent is to, although there's certainly some additional restrictions that would not have uh, previously existed on, say, Kenneth Street or other places downtown, uh, the intent is with the bylaw to provide additional uh, density through the floor area ratio and encourage uh, full utilization of the lots. So we're not seeing single story structures going forward and, and really um, limiting the overall development of, of downtown. And so in some cases that's going to mean that the smaller lots that uh, would would have had very limited uh, developable capabilities on their own as it is stands right now um, will require perhaps consolidation or at least partnerships with neighboring properties regarding access. Forced consolidation with neighbors. We're, uh, sorry, we're not, we, we, this is not a debate. We're right. hearing and writing down all your comments. Yeah. Um, we will be going forward or not going forward with, uh, and then yeah. what we hear from the public ref will reflect if there are changes to the bylaw when, we, sure. when those instances are brought forward. Yeah. But we, we're, not, we're not in a debate uh, back absolutely. and forth. Absolutely, no, 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 that's, I appreciate that. Um, I'm okay, just, I appreciate I'm that. Thank you. Stunned by the language, um, forced partnerships. I find that uh, um, very Partner, partnerships hopefully are not usually forced. Yes, that's um, that's maybe uh, shotgun weddings unique. in the 50s, possibly, but other yeah. than that, a very unique approach by the city to, in essence, force partnerships, um, or basically anyone who's stuck with a 30 lot um, just told to, well, you can just sell it to your neighbor because you have no use to it. So does that conclude your, your comments at this point? If you would like to add more, uh, depending on what you hear from others, you can have a chance to come back again at the, end of the, at the end of the meeting. Um, so I'm going to call now for a second time. Of any, is there anyone from the public who would like to present with respect to the zoning amendment bylaw? Thank you for coming forward, although I know you well. Just give your name and the street that you live on. My name is Michael Kelly. I live on Eath Street, um, otherwise known, sometimes known as Wipers. <laughs> and sometimes Ypres, which Ypres, is where I live across absolutely. the street. So We won't go into the to reason it's called Ypres here and now, but it has an interesting history. Anyway, um, my name is Michael Kelly. I uh, want to turn the conversation from the commercial uh, aspect of the zoning bylaw to uh, the residential uh, aspect of the zoning bylaw. I'm president of a strata corporation, the IS4072, and uh, which is located on Eve Street. We're a 14-unit strata corporation. We have next door to us, to the north of our building, a large vacant lot, which is unfortunately heavily abused at the present time. 
um, as it stands vacant and sort of only marginally tended to. Sometimes the grass gets cut and those sorts of things. So we're actually eager to see this lot uh, develop. But uh, in reviewing the, the new zoning bylaw, I, I, <laughs> I have to confess I suffer a bit of confusion. The lot, actually it's four lots, um, and I would suspect that if they are developed at some point in the future that they'll be consolidated into a single lot. So they, the lot is um, probably 60 feet, uh, and it runs all the way across, or the four lots actually are probably 60 feet combined on, on road frontages, and then run all the way across the block from Eat to Bray. Uh, the zoning um, went from, I think, R4 under the old scheme to uh, a new designation made by council at that time to R6. Um, I believe my predecessor uh, argued staunchly against such a, a um, zoning bylaw designation. So it went from a four-story um, possibility, and development possibility, to six stories. Now, with the, the new zoning bylaw, um, the text and the map, uh, here's where I run into the confusion. Uh, the text suggests that uh, this high density zone, which this, these lots would fall under, uh, are limited to five stories. Map limits this property or these properties to four stories. So I'm a little confused about that point. And then um, I, it, uh, I wasn't aware of the uh, floor area re ratio calculation that might be possible for, this, uh, for these properties and their development. Um, and I'm concerned that um, this could grow to even higher, taller than six stories. I'm hoping not. So uh, I think in the in the in the bylaw there needs to be some uh, resolution of this confusion, and I would appreciate certainty that any development that goes forward on those properties or that property will be no more than six stories. So thank you for that. Okay, thank you. Is I'm going to now ask for a third and final time, or is there anyone who would like to come forward? Is there anyone who would like to finally come forward for third and final time? Okay, hearing none, um, I want to thank you on behalf of Council for coming tonight to uh, listen, and for those who presented, I appreciate your input to Council. Uh, we will be dealing with this matter in the regular agenda of the council. Um, uh, there are, is also a staff recommendation. Not Council does not necessarily have to follow that staff recommendation. And um, uh, so if you want to stay for the uh, regular portion of the meeting um, uh, to hear the outcome, then we would uh, appreciate that as well. So thank you so much for coming. So I'm going to officially call the uh, meeting closed, the public hearing closed, and we have, uh, according to that clock and mine, just over five minutes, um, so we'll be uh, recessing until uh, 6 p.m. for the regular council.